Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Conversations on Inares. I'm Dr. Joseph Orozco. I'm a professor of philosophy at Oregon State University and the co-director of the Inares Project for Alternative Futures. The Inares Project is a forum for conversations, projects, and initiatives that imagine a future free of domination, exploitation, war, and empire. Here on Conversations on Inares, we talk with scholars, activists, and artists about the possibilities of radical social transformation today. Today, we're going to examine a hysteria that's currently sweeping the United States. Over the past few months, about a dozen states with Republican majority legislatures have passed laws banning the teaching of critical race theory in public schools. So we talked with Dr. Mark Nason to help us unpack what is going on with some of these bans. Mark Nason is a professor of history and African-American studies at Fordham University in New York City. His many books and articles cover African-American politics, labor history, popular culture, and educational policy. He's also the founder of the Bronx African-American History Project, and he's a frequent commentator on CNN, Fox News, The O'Reilly Factor, and most notably, I think uh, many people may know him uh, for his appearance on The Chappelle Show in the early 2000s. And he's been a frequent collaborator with the NRA's project on our blog for many years. Dr. Nyson says that people are confusing three things uh, with this, uh, these new bans that are taking place. Critical race theory, for one, which is a complex theoretical framework used in law schools and in academia. Then there's also culturally responsive pedagogy, which is about developing curriculum in K through 12 public schools to respond to the needs of multiracial and multi-ethnic school populations. And then there's also anti-racist sensitivity trainings, which are programs that are developed mainly for corporate HR and government institutions. Mark has written a statement decrying these bans on critical race theory. And he talks in uh, our discussion today about how we should approach the teaching of race in the United States. And he advises us that we should focus both on the horrors of white supremacy, but also on the bravery and joys of communities of color resisting and struggling for human dignity. So why don't we go ahead now and turn to our discussion on the bans on critical race theory with Dr. Mark Nason. All right, so we're here with uh, Dr. Uh, Mark Nason from Fordham University. Mark, it's a, a, a deep uh, honor of mine to have you on uh, the program. Um, you know, we've been collaborating for many years yeah. through the Nari's Project blog. You've been one of our consistent uh, voices that we that we amplify on there, but we've never had a chance actually to speak. So uh, it's a, it's an honor for me to uh, speak with you. I, I think I first became aware of you as a, a young person because of your appearance, of course, on the Chappelle Show oh, as the uh, sort of uh, the anonymous African American studies professor. So, but I've come to really gain great respect for your work. Uh, in uh, history and African American studies at Fordham, so uh, I just want to express to you my gratitude for being able to come on and, and speak with me a little bit. Well, well, thank you. I mean, uh, the Anna Rays Project has been a place where a lot of my writings have been circulated. It's something I really appreciate, uh, and so finally meeting you in person, uh, even through Zoom, is uh, is very exciting. No, and thank course, you. Thank uh, you. This particular subject is, uh, you know, to put it mildly, timely. Yeah. No. Right. And 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 the other thing, you know, we are discussing today on uh, uh, on Juneteenth. Right. right. Uh, uh, so uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. But yeah, I, I wanted to speak with you a little bit about this hysteria that's uh, been created in the past few months uh, because of critical race theory. And so, you know, as, as you know, over the past few months, about a dozen of states, most of them with Republican majority legislatures have passed laws and there have been various state school boards that have banned the teaching of, quote, what they call, quote, critical race theory in public schools. So as a professor of African-American history and studies, you, you've issued a short statement that you hope will be used by people to be read at school board meetings and other places where mm -hmm. educational policy is being discussed. And so I just wanted to read the statement for folks so that they can have it and then talk a little bit about with, uh, with you about okay. it. So the, the statement that you, that you wrote, that you, you sent for people that um, 
you know, folks essentially asked you to write for them, teachers around the country, um, state something like this. So, quote, critical race theory is a framework for viewing U.S. legal history that is widely discussed in law school classes and has occasionally been used as a guide to anti-racism training in universities, businesses, and government agencies. But it has never been used anywhere in the country to shape the development of curriculum in K through 12 schools. Treating it as a threat to public education is not only disingenuous, it is creating an atmosphere of panic that will discourage instruction in black history, indigenous history, and the history of race and immigration in the United States. Culturally responsive pedagogy is not critical race theory. Treating it as such will have profoundly destructive consequences. Do not give in to the hysteria, close quote. So uh, some questions I wanna ask you about this. In your understanding, what exactly is critical race theory? How should we understand this idea, this concept? Um, I may be the wrong person to ask because I've never studied it. It has never been part of my professional training. It has never, as you know, as someone whose uh, doctoral work was in American history and his research has been in African American. Uh, history, labor history, and the history of popular culture. Never have I discussed this with other historians. Never has it been discussed in the Department of African and African American Studies at Fordham. Mm. Um, insofar as I understand it, it, it's a framework for understanding the ways in which uh, white supremacy and racism have shaped all institutions in American society. Um, and it also has a component uh, which encourages people to interrogate their own positionality within those structures. Um, and that is... Both of those are controversial in different ways. Now, first of all, as a historian, I never try to present overarching theories to explain the subjects I study. I'm influenced by those theoretical frameworks, but for me, my historical research complicates as well as affirms any theoretical framework I am, you know, presented with. So as a historian, I'm very skeptical of somebody presenting me of a theoretical framework to teach. So yes, obviously I study white supremacy and racism in US history, but I also study resistance to those. I study, you know, phenomena which complicate that portrait. Um, and I'm always open to voices which have never been heard before, which may make any theoretical framework, you know, uh, have to be reevaluated. So that's one thing. You know, as a historian, I am not a social theorist. Mm -hmm. which may, is maybe a difference between me and a sociologist or a uh, political scientist. Right. Um, you know, I'm in love with new information that complicates everybody's theories. So what does it mean to say then that, um, you know, people have been, uh, from what I've seen from a lot of the discussion about this, is that people are saying that, there is this theoretical framework that's somehow being used to influence teacher training and the development of curriculum around the country. And you say it, that this is simply not no true. There's no evidence of that. What it has influenced is anti-racism training, which has proliferated following the murder of George Floyd. And in fact, the person who is most responsible for spreading this sort of, you know, manufactured panic over critical race theory was initially responding to anti-racism training in government agencies, 
both in the state of Washington, where he was living, and in government agencies in the federal government. And none of, you know, if, if you read everything of this guy, Chris Rufo wrote, 98% of it is response to anti-racism training that is going on uh, in businesses, in government agencies. But the, uh, what, what is the panic is about it being taught in public schools. And that is totally cynical and manufactured. So a lot of this seems to be following, uh, a lot of this is sort of like the after effects of the Trump administration, because mm -hmm. of course he did issue that executive order that banned the use of uh, diversity trainings and sensitivity trainings uh, in uh, government institutions. So this seems to be sort of uh, a little bit of after effects of the Trump administration. Yeah, People are picking also, up that agenda. Yes, absolutely. It's also a response to the Black Lives Matter movement and the proliferation of anti-racism training in places like police departments and the military. Mm. You know, there were a lot of people pissed off by being made to go to anti-racism training. Right. And you take the anger of those people and, the, the, uh, and then the anger of people uh, at the Black Lives Matter movement and you focus it on the public school instruction mm -hmm where this has no applicability. It's a manufactured crisis. It's, it's mass hysteria. Well, so let me ask this question then too, because we're, you know, we're well, talking but about- this, uh, We've done this before in history around rape. You know, the, you know, black men being seen, every black man being seen as a potential rapist. That was part of what drove lynching. And, you know, the creation of Jim Crow. It's the cynical use of, you know, of, of misinformation to achieve a goal of reinforcing, you know, a sanitized version of American history in schools. Well, this is the one thing I wanted to, that I was asking you about. So, you know, on the one hand, we have... Uh... CRT, which seems to be, you know, based on your uh, assessment, a kind of a, uh, a small, uh, not necessarily small, but a, a component of, ed of education in law schools and in higher education, yes. but not something that's been a trend that's uh, in educational policy or in curriculum development. But you, ha you, you have that on the one hand, and then you have the proliferation of diversity trainings and seminars in in business and in the military. Uh, but then you also distinguish in your statement culturally responsive pedagogy. And I was wondering if you could explain what you mean by that. What's culturally pe yeah. uh, sensitive pedagogy? Well, I, I think that culturally responsive pedagogy uh, was something that really began to emerge in the 80s and 90s as a way to improve levels of achievement of, among people from marginalized groups whose history was left out of textbooks and courses. Mm. So the idea was to uh, expand and modify curriculum so that the cultures uh, and, and traditions and history and voices of marginalized groups are within what is taught in, in, in our public schools. And that was also controversial when it first started. Uh, but over the last 20 years, you know, it's become, you know, more prevalent, especially as a spur to student achievement. And um, it's been used especially by people, by progressive educators, to say that if you want to improve achievement, create curriculum that gives, you know, the most marginalized students something to get excited and connect to rather than, you know, bombard them with test prep. Right. So a lot of the, the, the people I know in education, principals, teachers who are protesting against common core and, you know, uh, digested test-driven pedagogy, you said what we need is instead of test prep is culturally responsive pedagogy. 
give right. students material that allow that that increases their engagement with what they're learning. And a lot of that ends up being, you know, African-American, Latinx, you know, history, literature, music, art, um, and, and the like. Um, now, what it doesn't do is force all students to interrogate their identities. In other words, you present students with material that may make them more comfortable in some cases, and in other cases may make them a little, mm. little uncomfortable, but you leave it to them to, to, to work that through. Yeah, a lot of these bands actually that I've noticed in reading them uh, prohibit the teaching of any kind of material that they say would somehow emotionally harm or make people feel bad about themselves or the ethnic identity that they identify with. And so part of this worry is that, that something's being taught in K through 12 schools that's inflicting emotional damage on children. Well, so well, you, is you, that it, a response to culturally responsive pedagogy? It, it's, see, it's a, it's a sneak attack. Mm. Uh, on culturally responsive pedagogy and all the research being done on African-American, indigenous, Latinx history that is inevitably going to change some of the ways we view the history of the country. Mm. And you call it critical race theory and ban it. In other words, the label allows you to ban you know, expanding the historical uh, narrative. Not, see, what, what they're saying is you're, it is in critical race theory, everybody has to interrogate their own identities. Right, right. Now that's what may happen in a training pr program in a corporation or government agency. Everybody has to talk about, how does this make you feel? Right. But that's not what schools do, to my knowledge, nor should it be what they do. Yeah, I was going to ask you about this because you've come out and stated that even in your own teaching, when you teach the histories of immigration and of race in the United States, you don't necessarily seek to have students do that kind of interrogation of self, or you don't try to get them to have a I don't really kind of a reaction. It. Uh -huh. If they do it, fine. I don't require it. I don't require every, you know, Irish, Italian, Jewish, Arab student um, to say, when you're learning about the, Tusc uh, the Tulsa race massacre, how does it change how you think about yourself? Mm -hmm. I never do that. I present the material and then give students time and space to interpret it, but not in relation to their personal identity. That to me is an invasion of privacy in the classroom. To I don't ask want to go there. Now, maybe I know there are some people at some universities which require people to take courses where they interrogate their own identities. You will never catch me teaching that course. But do you, in your experience, do you find that your students tend to do that anyway on their own? In uh, some do and some don't. But what I have, see, what I've had conservative students come in and being really pissed out about racial sensitivity training mm -hmm. and come in and say, Dr. Nason, I love your classes because you present a lot of different voices, a lot of different perspectives, and allow us to make up our own minds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I am, I have a lot of those conservative students who have stayed in touch with me over the years, some of whom have changed enormously. Right. But in some cases, over four years, five years, six years. Yeah. yeah. It, not in two days. Yeah, also, yeah. I reject outcome. I, I, I refuse to participate in any forms of assessment from above where people say, what are your outcomes? Right. I yeah. say, I don't do outcomes. Or if you ask me for outcomes, outcomes my fist. <laughs> 
I, yeah, that's the boon in academia nowadays, assessment. No, I, 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 uh, I'm on an assessment strike. <laughs> Good I don't for you. participate precisely because I don't want my class, my pedagogy to be fit into particular boxes. Right. right. Even from the left. See, my job is to sabotage assessment. My job is to undermine theories, uh, even if they come from the left, even if they come from people who are anti-racist. I so you, would, you wouldn't say that your, your teaching then is, you wouldn't uh, uh, characterize your work as uh, anti-racist then? Um, I think it is but I, I wouldn't characterize it as that. Right, good, good. I, I do research that uncovers extremely uncomfortable information uh -huh. about what, you know, marginalized people have experienced. It is, I see my job as having those, is magnifying those voices. That's what my big research project, the Bronx African American History Project, right. we've completely revised the dominant narrative of Bronx history, but it's taken 20 years. Yeah. It, did, it didn't happen in a two day seminar. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I think people on the, you risk enforcing people to go to a certain place in a short amount of time, turning them off, which is what I think the, a lot of these racial sensitivity and anti-bias trainings have done. So part of, one of the things I, I was reading yesterday, the, the legislation that was passed by the um, Florida school board, most recently banning uh, the teaching of critical race theory. And they, they have a list of a variety of different things that they don't want in their uh, schools anymore. And, and they, they put it under the banner of efficient and faithful teaching. And one of the things that they say that does not count as uh, efficient and faithful teaching is the view that uh, racism, so this, is, this would not be allowed in Florida schools, the idea that racism is, is, quote, embedded in American society and its legal systems in order to uphold the supremacy of white persons, close quote. Instead, what they consider to be efficient and faithful teaching is emphasizing that racism is what they say, quote, merely a product of prejudice. And so this seems to that, that, kind of go on this distinction of between institutional and personal racism. Yeah, well, so, to me, that is something to be sabotaged. Yeah, I was wondering, what do you think I, about I this mean, distinction? I don't, you know, race, you know, you examine objectively how racism has shaped political, economic, social, cultural behavior, and um, also look at anti, you know, forces which are contradictory to that and let the chips fall where they may. But you, you know, if you're in Florida, you have to look at the state's history of segregation. You mm -hmm. have to look at its history of lynching. You have to look at its history of displacement and murder of indigenous people. Are those the only things that have gone on in Florida? No, but they're part of it. You have to come to terms to it. So would you say, uh, you know, we were talking before about theory and uh, sort of imposing sort of certain kinds of frameworks. I think that part of my reading of what was going on in this Florida uh, uh, amendment was that uh, the school board was concerned that a certain kind of framework was being imposed on teaching that was about the definition of racism. So that they were, uh, they were concerned that a certain idea of institutional racism is being upheld in the curriculum. And they wanted to reduce that to just simply saying that right, racism is just the feelings of racial animus that some people have in their hearts, but it's not a description of how society works. In well, way. you know, right. You know, what I would say in response is racism is also about power. It's right. about certain groups trying to 
monopolize for themselves access to power, prestige, wealth, employment. Um, and um, that's what's happened through much of American history. At, but there's were also forces fighting against that. Right. And, you know, so the tension between the, inst, you know, institutionalized racism and, uh, you know, various forces which seek to fairly utilize the talents of everyone, that's a continuous tension in U.S. history. So let's explore the tension between institutional racism and more democratic forces, which have been there. Sometimes those democratic forces are even driven by capitalism in order to have a fairer access to the labor force. Sometimes right. it's driven by national interests, like in World War II, where you need to, to, to win a war, use the talents of the entire population. And you end up challenging existing prejudices and, and challenging structures of racial exclusion because they, they stand in the way of that goal. Right, right. Um, you know, what I think is you have, you know, the Florida School Board is the enemy of historical complexity, and so are some critical race theorists. And my job is to mess with both of them. Gotcha. But never let anybody stop the continuous research we're doing to uncover the tragic, you know, violence and uh, uh, denial of access to wealth and resources directed at marginalized people, African Americans, indigenous people. We have, and, and, not, and if they're not gonna not let us do it in the schools, then we create museums. We, you know, we create monuments. There should be a Florida lynching museum. If you can't teach in the schools, let's go and talk about that history or the history of, you know, of massacres of indigenous people. You know, this is a time for us to expand our reach with the information that we're getting about, you know, uh, what has really happened to Black, uh, Latinx, Indigenous, and other, you know, marginalized peoples in U.S. history. Well, this seems you know, to be part of what the, the response is by these legislators, is that um, I, part of what I've seen is a lot, I, I mean, in the Florida Amendment, once again, to refer to that one, uh, bans the use of the 1619 project that the New York Times put out a couple of years ago, uh, which holds that the founding of the country is should be thought of as beginning with um, uh, the slave trade, the beginning of the slave trade in North America in 1619 rather than in 1776, which of course prompted uh, the Trump yeah. administration in its last days to issue its 1776 report. So there's this kind of going back and forth oh, about oh, oh. what are the sources of history to use. I mean, I, I'm, I'm against radically simplifying. You know, the way I see it, you know, uh, there's, the, you know, there were people who came here to colonize, to expropriate, uh, to find cheap labor anywhere they could and exploit it. Mm. And there were people who came here, you know, to find a new way of life here because they were persecuted in the fact both of those are part of this history. It's not one or the other, it's both. Right. So um, there's, do you, are you familiar with the song by Mark Knopfler and James Taylor, Sailing to Philadelphia? No, I'm not. Go listen to it because it, it counts both, of, it points out how for, you know, Europeans locked in a certain hierarchical society, America was an opening to find their, 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 their voice, their vision, their opportunity. And then, but there's that nagging question, how can this America be free mm. if we're in the land of the Iroquois? You know, it's so it's, a, it, and look, this is, you know, part of what I write about when I'm dealing with the Bronx is how Italian, Irish, and Jewish 
people came to the U.S. to escape persecution and class hierarchy where they were, but discovered that the price of doing this was excluding Black people. Mm -hmm. So they did it in the housing market and occasionally the job market. You know, both of those are real. America, you know, that America is a land of liberty that is plagued with, you know, racial hierarchy, exclusion, Mm -hmm. and occasionally, you know, murder and persecution. Yeah. Um, We got to we got to talk about all of it. Well, it seems you know it seems very clear that's what going what's going on with a lot of this stuff is um, people are using this term uh, critical race theory incorrectly. They have a certain kind of picture of a boogeyman in their mind, which, as you're putting it, seems to be much more about uh, uh, racial sensitivity training. But the the intent of these bans altogether seems to be to shut down, as you say, the teaching of multicultural, yeah. multiracial history in the United States. I, exactly. why, why do you think at this particular moment people are so afraid of the teaching of this kind of history that you've dedicated your career to? Um, why did they storm the White House? Hmm. They're scared. They're scared that the America they were comfortable with is vanishing before their eyes, that they're being outnumbered by growing numbers of, you know, immigrants of color, of, that um, their own children are turning against them. Yeah. That's yeah. the other thing yeah. that people are not talking about. You know, I see this in my own classes. Uh-huh. We're probably, you know, at my university, uh, the white parents, 60 to 70 percent voted for Trump. Mm -hmm. Probably, you know, only 30 to 40 percent of their children. did. Yeah. You know, so there is this real fear. We are losing the America which we grew up in. And where people like us were seen as the sort the, the people who made the country great. Yeah. Yeah. And now all of a sudden we're supposed to be ashamed of who we are. Right. And our children. Now here's the point where I think we need to listen to them. This that you know, the stuff about the history is outrageous. But asking children to separate themselves by race and interrogate their own identities, I don't think that's an acceptable thing to do in public schools. How come? Because I think there is a level that you have to respect students' privacy Mm. in some way. You don't, you know, I don't want somebody asking my grandchildren who your, what their gender and race identity is. I think we, you know, we can talk about these subjects, but asking them to personalize it is, is going down a very slippery slope. Right, right. Um, So part of this is, no, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. And, and, And there are people I'm sure who disagree with me, who agree with me in everything I say about the history. Right. Uh, But I don't go there in my classes and I can understand parents not wanting teachers to do that. You're white, Susie. Or or maybe even, uh, you know, how do you know what Susie is? Yeah. By looking at her. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so I, 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 I think there is a level to which we have to be very careful in how in, in how we ask people to examine their own positionalities. I think and, we and have so to get- where, where would that be in society? I know that you spoke about sort of saying that we need to kind of open up discussions of race outside of the academy in one sense uh, and think about public history in a broader way. Where, where should we have those conversations about our own positionalities in the United States? Where would be- appropriate I think to have we could that? have that in voluntary settings. 
mm-hmm. you know, that, you know, you, you, you have a session at, 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 at a school where we're going to have a discussion about racial identity, if you'd like to come. Uh, um, you know, uh, you can have, I, certainly these happen at university sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Um, requiring them, you know, it, well, one of the things I've seen, the, it backfired. Mm. I have a lot of, I, I, a lot of conservative students take my classes. You know, I get, you know, and they they feel comfortable there, even though they're going to learn more Black, Latinx and Indigenous history and more about the history, you know, of racism in America than they will in almost any other class. But I don't tell them what they're supposed to do with it. Mm-hmm. And in like teaching a course, it's an affirmative action. I, I expose them to conservative thinkers like Carl Cohen, you know, Thomas Sowell. I said, okay, yeah. there are these debates going on. Yeah. You figure out what, you know, this is up for you. I have, what I tell them is I can't presume that I can present the same material to you as to me and get the same response because you've lived a different life. Mm-hmm. You have to figure it out what to do with this. And I, I also tell them the first day of class, if you feel, want to be in a safe place, you're in the wrong place. <laughs> Everybody in my classes is going to be exposed to something that is going to get them upset. Right. But I'm not going to tell you what to do with it. But if you want to feel safe, you know, you can take another class. So part of this seems to be the, what's the, the, the ripple effect, it seems, is that these are just going to, make teachers really intimidated to touch any kind of material on race uh, in the school. Or or Uh, the opposite. They'll figure out clever ways to bring it in and dare people to attack it. Yeah, yeah. It also will make a lot more people look at critical, what what, actually, what is critical race theory? Right. You know, how many people like, you know, nobody knew what this is. And now you're going to look at this and say, you know, have real discussions about race in, Amer- in, in American history. Um, yeah, I've, I've started to notice that on Twitter is that people are starting to share back and forth, like the titles of some of the key texts in critical race theory. Yeah. Uh, which that will be interesting because some of this stuff is uh, uh, not necessarily easy to grasp without, you know, uh, <laughs> educational sure. background in, in, in legal theory or sociology. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, and it's also going to do things like what I suggest. Like, look, one of the things I did is I'm not a critical race theorist, but I posted all these examples of racism and white supremacy in U.S. history. Mm-hmm. And say, what is this? Is this history or critical race theory? You decide. Right, right. I actually sent you four of these four narratives, which I wrote. Yeah, I, I, and we'll try to share that, too, as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, I, you know, one of the things, you know, I, like I said at the at the beginning of all of this, we are recording this today on on uh, Juneteenth, on June nineteenth, twenty twenty one, and so this year uh, the federal government has made Juneteenth a, a federal holiday, uh, a holiday that's you know largely uh, kind of a Texas celebration, recognition of the Emancipation Proclamation in Texas. But now it's a, na- a national holiday. So there's been a lot of criticism about this holiday um, or this action because at the same time the Senate has failed to move on things like uh, ex- you know protecting uh, voting access. It's also right. failed to move on you know, passing a, a, the Emmett Till bill on uh, uh, protection against lynching. So um, a lot of people are saying this is very, very kind of symbolic without any kind of neat substance. Uh, do, you, do you feel that that's what's going on in a lot of our public discussions well, I, about I race? I think we're facing a lot of contradictory impulses here. Mm-hmm. You know, that even the people attacking critical race theory want to be able to say we're not anti-Black. Right, right. Um, so here they're taking an event, which on the face of it is profoundly challenging. That no one, nobody in Texas 
you know, uh, turned the Emancipation Proclamation into reality until federal troops arrived there at the end of the Civil War. Which will also, I think, encourage people to examine race in Texas history. Mm, yeah. and, you know, the whole is what happened to the Reconstruction governments? How many justices, black justices of the peace were murdered? Right. What happened to black militia in Texas? How many of them were killed in overthrowing Reconstruction? Were there any examples like Tulsa in Texas history of mm -hmm. prosperous black communities which were attacked? Um, you know, what is the relationship between how Mexican Americans were treated during the years of Jim Crow and yeah. of African Americans? Yeah. I mean, I think it'll make people incredibly curious about race in Texas history. And it'll give us, the his, people like me, an incredible amount of work to do. <laughs> Which in so you, turn, seem, you, know, you seem positive about a lot of these. Classes. Yeah. Well, you seem positive about a lot of these developments. Uh, but, you know, you framed this, too, uh, right, uh, with the, the insurrection on January 6th, that there's a a fear going on here. So what do you see going forward uh, uh, in this country about the dynamics of uh, racial politics, these demographic changes? Do you have a sense of where you think we might be going from? Everything, to quote Bob Marley, everything is war. Hmm. You know, we're going to have a war over the future of the country and the interpretation of the past. And that's a war I've been fighting all my life. Welcome to my world. I was, I love fights. So you think that this is going to be more contentious going on still? Oh, my while. God. It's going to be. You look, I, that statement that I've written has probably been read in like a thousand school board meetings. You've created an audience for me. You've created an audience for the stories I shared with you mm -hmm. about you know, the complicity of immigrants who were discriminated against themselves with white-only policies in, in post-war housing. You've also, you know, or the stories about, you know, how, you know, in, in the history of this country, you know, Black police officers and soldiers were systematically murdered in overthrowing Reconstruction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We now have an, an opening to talk about what really went on. Thank you, critical race hysterists. <laughs> You're well, a, bigger a bigger platform. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, now the people I worry about are the poor public. We're, we're okay in the universities. They can't yeah. touch us. This is, uh, you know, MC Hammond. You can't touch this. They can yell all they want about what we do, but they can't touch it. It's the goddamn public school teachers who are under assault. And we in the universities need to defend them. And how can we do that? What's the best way, do you think, that we can support our colleagues in K-12? through to, to go and say, teach it. You know, we're not in here to have you make every child interrogate their racial identity. But we are here to say that all the new research on uh, race in U.S. history needs to gradually be incorporated in school curriculum. We need to, you know, even if it complicates our vision of American history, it's not going to erase, you know, the, the, you know the, the, the power of democratic trends in American society. Mm -hmm. There, there's going to be a tension between that and, and, and the history of racism and white supremacy. But it's not all racism and white supremacy. Right, right. That's important, but it's not all. We're not going to erase everything else. Right. The, so you, you want to emphasize that kind of the, the histories of, of, of struggle as well. Yeah, the histories of struggle and the complexities of it. Okay, let me give you an example from the Bronx. Okay, yeah. um, 1930s, it was virtually impossible for black families to move into most neighborhoods of the Bronx. They couldn't rent apartments or buy houses, even though the majority of the people 
who lived in the Bronx at that time were Irish, Italian, and Jewish. You couldn't rent an apartment in a middle-class Jewish neighborhood along the Grand Concourse until the 1960s. But when the Depression broke out, landlords in a Jewish working class neighborhood called Morrisania, filled with socialist and communist and trade union people who, who were, they worried about losing their buildings, figured that because of the kinds of people who live in their neighborhood, they could rent their apartments to uh, blacks who had depression proof jobs. So they put signs in their windows, we rent to select colored families. And you know, families of Pullman porters and postal workers started moving into this neighborhood, Morrisania, with no hostility and no opposition, creating the most, you know, racially integrated neighborhood in the United States for about 20 years, with its most racially integrated high school. So all there were, uh, you know, so here you had a phenomenon which challenged the larger narrative, but which was still highly significant because it meant that all these black families could have access to better schools, better housing, better shopping, and also an experience of something other than unmitigated hostility and exclusion. Right, right. right. Based elsewhere. How does that fit? It doesn't. Nobody knew about it until we started interviewing people. And that that same neighborhood would end up producing more varieties of popular music than any place in the world. Because you had the, you also had uh, Puerto Ricans and Cubans moving in. And with the Jewish and Italian people, everybody was sharing their musical cultures. Hmm. And you had in the same neighborhood, bebop, uh, Dixieland, uh, Afro-Cuban music, doo and you know, salsa, funk, and rock and roll. So how do you explain that theory, that phenomenon within critical race theory? Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right, right. So there's a sort of a broader kind of spectrum of, of resistance, of struggle, of liberation that we find in history that you want to unleash rather than to narrow yeah, exactly. down. Into- so, so here's the story with both sides of it. This, we, we interviewed this amazing woman, Avis Hansen. Who uh, was uh, from a West Indian family um, uh, who became a teacher uh, and a uh, chair of English departments, assistant principal, event, who grew up in Morrisania. So she was living in Harlem in the, in the Depression and she was precocious. And her mother uh, went to her school in Harlem to see what was going on. And when she went in, the, this was in first grade, the teacher was having coffee with the principal while Avis was reading note cards to the class. She mm-hmm. came back again, saw that this was happening. She said, I can't go that, do the, uh, that to my daughter. Where do I find good schools where the Jewish people live? Mm-hmm. So she went to the Morrisania section of the Bronx, saw the signs we rent to select our colored families and moved there. Mm-hmm. So Avis in the school she was in was always the top student. And there was no hostility to this until she had this Irish teacher in fifth grade um, who who did everything she could to sort of undermine Avis. So Avis won the spelling bee in her class, in her school, in the district. And but she didn't have the car fare to go. Mm -hmm. So the the teacher, I won't mention her name, said Avis is going to get go to was going to go to the spelling bee in the district, but she didn't have the money, so she couldn't go. So mm-hmm. Avis said there was this little Jewish boy named Max who wore overalls and a white t-shirt. He came up and put his arm around her and said, it ain't no crime to be poor. Hmm. How do you fit that in with anybody's picture? You know. Well, well. So this is the history that I present that complicates narratives and theories. Yeah, I, that, uh, that makes sense. And I think that, that uh, this is something that we need to, these, these bands are things that we need to struggle against because they sort of want to narrow down the teaching of history into- The bands uh, are outrageous 
but so are efforts to make everything seem like it's one big narrative of white supremacy. Mm, right, right. That's what I was going to say. And, that, and to make people interrogate, well, how do you fit in against this? Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. That makes sense. Well, Mark, I want to say uh, this has been uh, enlightening. Thank you for the, the work that you do. Thank you for helping us to understand a little bit about what these bands are. And um, it's uh, exciting to see your work and support of public school teachers. Uh, and uh, I know that many, uh, many teachers in the, in the classrooms look up to you as someone who can give them uh, understanding of all of these issues. And so appreciate your work uh, with those teachers everywhere. And so I uh, want to say thank you for coming uh, 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 to speak with us a little bit. Uh, and I hope that we can uh, continue discussing and perhaps have you back for discussion oh, no. more about some of your this work. This was great. I mean, I thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. I know that, I, you know, I'm not going to please a lot of people on the left with what I say, but uh, maybe I will. Maybe oh. it doesn't matter. Maybe it doesn't matter. Yeah, uh, but no, I, I think well, I, a I, great I, opportunity to talk honestly about history yeah. and, and its complexities without uh, mitigating the horrors that have been inflicted on marginalized people, but also their ability to resist, fight back, make their voices heard, because that's part of what this is a reaction against. Right. And also just it, too, the, what I know about your work is, especially in the way that you present pop, uh, popular culture, is in uh, the joy of struggle and the joy right. of fighting and resisting through yeah. music, through song, through uh, various forms of art. So uh, uh, as you were talking about, just sort of like the, uh, the enormous kinds of ways of expression of thinking about freedom, uh, liberty, but also, you know, horror and pain. Right. It's sort of like what Cornel West talks about with the blues, right? The blues as a, as a, a beautiful mm -hmm. reaction to horrible life circumstances. Yeah. And that seems to be something that you really always- But it's not just the blues. It's also like Robin Kelly says, it's insisting on your right to be, to joy. Yeah. yeah. The right to joy. It's not just the blues. Sometimes- right. Joy is the best way of striking out against your, you know, your oppressors. Right. Being happy uh, yeah. when someone wants to bring you down. Right. Very good. Okay. Well, thank you, Mark. I really appreciate uh, your time with us. And, you know, viewers and listeners, thank you for your time with us. If you have any questions or comments, go ahead and leave us some comments down below uh, or contact us. We are available as the Inares Project on all of the socials. Uh, we look forward to hearing your reactions and your thoughts about this new critical race theory hysteria in the country. Leave us some comments. Thanks once again, Mark, and hope to see you soon. Okay, cool.